You found us here at Eastminster United Church in Belleville, Ontario. It's the 15th of April, 2012, the first Sunday after Easter. And we've just heard a beautiful, beautiful hymn speaking of the ancient words, the ancient words that tell us the story that have the power to change our lives. We remember, as uh, was told to us in that bit of scripture a few moments ago, that after what we know as Easter, after Jesus had been executed, buried, he appeared again to his disciples. And when they finally realized who he was, he opened to them, he helped them understand the ancient words, the scriptures. May it be so for us now. Let's pray. Grant, O oh God, that as we spend this time reflecting on words of ancient text, that with your help, what we will hear in them, whatever words are spoken now, what we will hear is the word you would speak to us today. Amen. You remember the TV series, All in the Family? One of my favorite episodes in All in the Family was the one in which Archie tries to persuade his daughter and son-in-law to have their baby baptized. Gloria and Mike, otherwise known as the Meathead, quite properly feel that it would be hypocritical for them as unbelievers to make the vows of the sacrament. They might not embrace Christian belief, but they understand it and they respect it. Unfortunately, Archie does neither. According to his self-generated belief system, the baby has to be baptized or something bad is going to happen to him. And so without telling the parents, he takes the baby to the long-suffering Reverend Felcher and demands a quick and easy splash of holy water. Without the consent of the parents, the minister quite rightly refuses to do the baptism. So Archie goes into the sanctuary and does it himself. Now, it's a touching scene. The hard-headed but soft-hearted grandfather gently holds the child and, and cups the water onto his head, all the while explaining to God his intentions and describing what now God is obliged to do in return. It's touching, and it is absurd. It's a mockery of the sacrament because Archie refuses to listen to any voice but his own. He decides what God wants. He decides what God should do. He decides how God can be manipulated. And then having truly made God in his own image, Archie does exactly what Archie wants to do. And we do it all the time. We make God in our own image. And Archie Bunker lives. Every time we claim that our opinion on any subject exactly matches the will of God. We do it when we invoke the name of God to legitimize our wars. We do it when we use the name of God to justify our prejudices. We do it when we use the name of God to demonize our enemies. We do it when we use the name of God to ostracize those who are different from us. We do it when we use the name of God to rationalize our own shortcomings. But let me speak for myself. Uh, most of you aren't going to be surprised to hear me say that there are some things that I feel so strongly that I will testify, preach, and try to persuade at any opportunity. And some of those things about which I feel so strongly are rooted in my understanding of God's will, supported by my interpretation of Scripture, and usually confirmed by the fact that, that, that people I respect agree with me. And I make no apology for this because every one of us is responsible to discern our understanding of truth and right and wrong and then to speak and act accordingly. But we cross a line if we claim or even indicate that our opinion, our understanding of truth and right and wrong is exactly and necessarily the same as God's. If I ever claim to speak for God without the qualifying admission that I can only give my opinion of God's will, then you will know that I have crossed that line, that I have chosen to make God in my own image, and you will know 
that Archie Bunker lives. Creating God in our own image is, is wonderfully convenient, and though it is terribly wrong, we could argue that we have no choice. When it comes to God, all we know is what we know, and what we know best is ourselves. That's why white Europeans and North Americans typically visualize God as an old white guy. And that's why the most common picture of Jesus hanging on walls of Sunday school classrooms across the country, including, a, I think, a couple of places in this building, that picture of Christ depicts the master as if he grew up in a place like Marmara, not Nazareth. And there's nothing wrong with that, so long as we never forget that those images of God and Christ are figments of our corporate imagination, so long as we never claim or force on others the assumption that the God we create in our own image is necessarily the way God must be. After Jesus was dead and buried, his friends were left to figure things out for themselves. Now there were times during their three years together when the master had spoken so clearly about God and God's will that it was, well it was almost simple, but that was before. That was during those heady days when they allowed themselves to believe that they were going to live happily ever after. Now he was dead. Now nothing was simple anymore, especially now three days later after the tomb had been found empty and several of the women were telling stories about an angel who spoke of resurrection. So you see, those friends of Jesus were trying to figure out what we call Easter and they weren't getting very far. Not unlike the Sunday school teacher who asked her class if they knew what happened on Easter Sunday and why it was so important. And one of the willing darlings said, Teacher, teacher, I know, I know, Easter, Easter is when the whole family gets together and we eat a lot of turkey and we give thanks. No, said the teacher, that's not it. I know, I know, said another. Easter is when you get a tree and you decorate it and, 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 and everybody gets presents and we sing a lot of songs. No, no, said the teacher, that's, that's not it either. And then a third spoke. Easter is when Jesus was killed and put in a tomb for three days. Oh, imagine her relief. Imagine how she felt when, when she realized that at least one of the kids knew what it was ab about. But then the kid went on. And then everybody gathers at the tomb and waits to see if Jesus comes out. And if he sees his shadow, he has to go back inside and we have six more weeks of winter. And you know, that's not terribly different from, from how the disciples were trying to figure out a mystery which was beyond their comprehension. They had seen Jesus die. They probably helped bury him in that borrowed tomb. They should have, that should have been the end of it. And now, well, there was no trace of the body. It had disappeared. And what did it mean? Left to their own resources, they just could not figure it out. Left to our own resources. We cannot comprehend the great mysteries of, of divine identity and intention because the will of God is not given to us on silver plates of easy understanding. When Jesus was absent from them, the disciples were mostly clueless. So what in heaven's name gives us the right to assume that we, by ourselves, can do any better. Here's a question that's bound to provoke good discussion. Maybe you can have one in the cafe after the service. The question is this, what's wrong with the church today? Depending on who's answering, there's either too little respect for tradition or too much adherence to, uh, to, to, the, to the new stuff. There is either too much music or not enough music or not the right kind of music. The sermons are either too shallow or they're so deep they're boring. Everybody agrees that there's never enough young people. We could always use more volunteers. We could always use help to bridge the gap between income and expenses. There's lots of answers to the question, what's wrong with the church today? Many other deficiencies that keep the church from being everything that the body of Christ ought to be. But I would argue... I would argue that by far the greatest weakness in the church is this. Our churches are full of people 
who stopped learning about faith when they stopped being children. In ancient times, a king had a boulder placed in the middle of the roadway. And then he hid himself and he watched to see if anybody would make the effort to move that huge obstacle. Now some of the king's wealthiest merchants came along and the courtiers came by and they looked at the boulder and they walked around that boulder and they mumbled and grumbled about the boulder and some loudly blamed the king for not keeping the roadways clear. But none of them did anything to move that stone out of the way. But then a peasant came along, carrying a load of vegetables. Upon approaching the boulder, he laid down his burden, and he moved the stone. He tried first to push, to pull, to do everything he could, and he picked up a stick, and he managed with a, with a great deal of effort to lever it, and finally he did manage to move the boulder out of the way. And then he's about to pick up his load of vegetables. He saw that lying in the place where the boulder has been, there was a sack, a sack filled with gold coins a small fortune, and in the sack was a note from the king indicating that the gold belonged to the person who moved the boulder out of the way. Well, Jesus didn't talk about boulders, but in stories, well, like the parable of uh, the pearl of great price, the parable of the, of the lost coins, the master warned us that the will of God is not given to us on silver platters of easy understanding. The Pharisees rejected Jesus. They reacted by accusing him of distorting the teachings of the law. But Jesus was just demonstrating that God does not give truth on silver platters of easy understanding. You know that, uh, that commandment about the Sabbath, Jesus said to them? Well, there's more to it than just taking a day off and adultery. I'm telling you that any of you who has lustful thoughts for a person who is somebody else's partner, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Well, the Pharisees thought that he was challenging their authority by contradicting their teaching, but in fact, Jesus wasn't doing that. All he was doing was encouraging them and all of us to stop going around the boulder. To make the effort to learn and to comprehend and in the process to discover the grace of enlightenment that is more precious even than any purse of golden coins. Back to the story. As the disciples wrestled with their bewilderment, a stranger appeared with a suddenness that terrified them. What is this, a ghost, they said, on top of everything else we've been through? We're now going to be haunted by some supernatural force of evil? Such was their fear and confusion they didn't even recognize their friend, not until he showed them the marks of the nails in his hands and feet. They were still not sure until he asked for a piece of fish and ate it. Can it be? Can it be? Surely not, but it must be. It is. It's him. And then according to Luke, he opened their minds to understand. The will of God is not given to us on silver platters of easy understanding. Moving boulders is nothing compared with the effort it takes to comprehend the mysteries of, of divine identity and intention. It's no wonder we so easily resort to the easy theology of Archie Bunker. It's no wonder we translate scripture and interpret divine revelation through the filters of our own experience, our perception, our advantage. It's no wonder we keep recreating God in our own image. It's no wonder, but it's no excuse. Before we find the purse filled with precious gold, we've got to make the effort to move the boulder. Before we can appreciate the nature of God and comprehend the will of God, we've got to make the effort to study the scriptures and fathom the mysteries and resolve the inconsistencies and discover the truth. What Jesus called the truth that sets us free. The truth that lies, that lies waiting to be found if we're willing to make the effort. And as surely as the peasant could find within himself whatever it took, whatever it took when he was willing to try to get that boulder out of the way, God gives us the ability to know what is right and righteous and true because God has given us Jesus who is able to open our minds. 
Jesus is our key to understanding the scriptures and fathoming the mysteries and discovering the truth. All we have to do is claim his presence. All we have to do is make the effort to hear the one who is waiting to be heard. All we have to do is make the effort to see the one who is waiting to be seen. So you see, now we've got two sets of possibilities. We have God created in our own image. And we have God revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the one hand, we have the God of our imagining, kind of looks like us. The God of our desiring, kind of does what we want God to do. On the other, we have Jesus. And we get to choose. We get to choose. We can believe the truth as it is revealed in Jesus, or we are completely free to believe whatever the heck we want to believe. Neither the identity nor the intentions of God are given on silver platters of easy understanding, but that's okay, because if we're willing, we have Jesus, like a purse full of gold coins just waiting to be found. Let me illustrate it finally with, a, with just a couple of quick stories. George Matheson. George Matheson was one of the great preachers of the Church of Scotland. Uh, he, he gave... Um, what I believe to be the very best definition of, of the church. Uh, he says, the church is the only organization known to humankind for which the only qualification for membership is that the candidate be completely unqualified. I love that. Well, it was this George Matheson uh, who left an incredible legacy of wisdom and faith-filled eloquence that included not just quotes like that, but the great hymn, O love that wilt not let me go. You know it? But it was not always so for Mr. Matheson. In the early days of his ministry, he suffered a crisis of faith that left him plagued by doubt. You know how that feels? The God he had created in his own image had proven to be inadequate, that God was unreliable. And such was the conflict between what he thought he believed and the realities of his experience that he decided in good conscience that, well, he had to quit. He had to resign his ministry. Well, the church, however, in wisdom, I think, refused to let him go. Officials told him that he should stay and preach as much about Christianity as he was able to believe. And so he did, and a strange thing happened. While Matheson carried on the business of talking about Jesus and praying in the name of Jesus and helping people for the sake of Jesus, the doubts which had once tormented him were gradually rendered meaningless, and finally it was faith not doubt that had the final word in his life. And he was able to write something like this, O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller. Carl Rogers was not so fortunate. The man who made his name as one of the godfathers of modern psychology was originally headed for a career in the church. You may not have known that. At 22, he entered Union Theological Seminary in New York. Soon after that, he participated in a seminar that was organized to explore religious doubts. Rogers later explained what happened. He wrote, the majority of members, in thinking their way through questions that had been raised, thought themselves right out of religious work. And I was one. The difference between Matheson and Rogers is not about their doubting. It's important to note. It's not about their doubting. They both had doubts. Just like we all have doubts. Doubting is inevitable because there will always be inconsistencies and conflict between the identity and intentionality of God as created in our own image and the realities of our experience. The difference between Matheson and Rogers, the difference between love that will not let me go and thinking yourself out of religion, the difference is Jesus. Put another way, the difference between those equally wise and well-intentioned men is that Rogers tried to come to Christ 
through understanding. Matheson, on the other hand, came to understanding through Christ. When the disciples were on their own with only their own experience, intelligence, and perceptions to go by, they could not make sense of what had happened. They had no hope of figuring out Easter and all that it meant. But then, then when they were able to see Jesus who was already with them, they began to understand the scriptures. Then they began to fathom the mysteries. Then they began to discover the truth. You see, it's all about Jesus. It's all about claiming his presence and putting him first. We do not come to Christ through underst understanding. We come to understanding through Christ. It's all about Jesus. Amen.